All right, guys. So uh, welcome to this uh, first um, session for the conference. So as Kristen said, um, this is really the most fun and uh, popular uh, session of the week. Um, and today we're going to talk about <clears throat> what's new in, in the DHS2 software. Um, and we're going to focus on the latest two releases. So you're going to see all of the good, good and new stuff that came out in, in those releases. We have a lot of great things for you um, in this afternoon. There's a lot of improvements um, across new visualization types. Um, there's plenty of new apps. We have a lot of performance improvements. There's usability improvements, uh, and of course, stability and, and platform uh, enhancements as well. So for this session, uh, we're going to have uh, basically four um, sections. There's going to be analytics, which is led by um, Scott Rospatrick, who is the product manager for, for the analytics product. Um, for the tracker section, we're going to have Marcus presenting. Marcus is the uh, team lead for, for tracker. Um, and then for the Android app, we're going to have uh, Marta Villa and Jose uh, Munoz from, um, from Spain uh, presenting on the Android. Um, app and then there's going to be uh, Austin McGee, who is the uh, sort of lead architect and also now deputy tech lead for DHS2, um, to get it with me to present on the platform enhancements. Um, and then we're going to have uh, a few minutes towards the end for questions. So if you have any questions, you know, there will be a chance to ask those towards the end. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to, to you, Scott, to ta start talking about the analytics part. Great, thanks for the introduction, Lars. Let me just make sure I get my screen shared here. Let me know when you can see it, please. Yep, I can see it. And you're looking at the slide deck, correct? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, it's amazing to see so many good, close friends and colleagues uh, tuning it's in. It's not the presentation, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go back and forth. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, just a little easier this way. Um, we have a tremendous number of analytics features to try to highlight for you. We're actually not going to be able to get through everything that was in the 35 and 36 release. We're just going to get the highlights. But before I get started, I do just want to say, please don't leave this without any, without, if you have any questions, without those questions being answered. Uh, you can track me down on this community practice. You can find me in Gather. You can virtually walk right up to me and let's talk. Um, so I'm going to have to go quite quickly. But again, please do reach out if you have any questions. All right, let's start with the dashboards. Lots of cool stuff coming in the dashboards app in the 35 and 36. The first thing we're gonna look at is uh, dashboard printing. Now it's very easy to print a dashboard. We also have filter settings now, a fairly popular request that we've been able to put in. We have a full screen dashboard item presentation mode that uh, makes it much easier to view um, analytics and share analytics uh, from one screen. And highly anticipated, very happy to announce and share with you all the mobile or cell phone friendly uh, dashboard application. So let's just go over to DHIS2. The first thing that we're gonna look at is dashboard printing. Now this is very simple. On the dashboard app, we just need to go to the more button and we go down to the final option, which is print. And you see that we have two print options. We have dashboard layout print and a single item per page. Let's just take a look at the dashboard layout print. And when I do this, you'll see that the dashboard print layout is coming in the same layout that, that I have on the standard dashboard. Of course, there are we are putting in page breaks. It's a standard A4 size piece of paper. We're putting in page breaks, but you can configure your dashboard so that it's fairly printer friendly, meaning that all of your dashboard items fit onto a single piece of paper so that it, it makes sense. Right now, you're just seeing an example of uh, DHIS2 kind of auto rendering it. But again, you can configure your, da your dashboard to be more printer friendly. If I click the print button in the top right corner, of course, I get all of my various print options. I can save it as a PDF. I can attach it to an email, send it out as kind of a, a routine report. If I exit the print preview, and go back to my print options once again. I'm going to go to my single item per page just to let you see what that looks like. So this is what this is going to put every single dashboard item to take up a full page. And, and you can see those coming now. And essentially this makes it so it's a little bit easier to share data. You can print this out, use it in a meeting, uh, pass it around, just makes it a little bit easier to understand and interpret the analytics that you have presented on your dashboard. All right, moving right along. It has been a long request to us that 
um, the folks who are making dashboards are saying that all of these filter options that you have on each one of the dashboards is not always that useful. Sorry, we're just waiting for DHIS2 to load. And, and you're telling us that not all of the dashboards need all of these different filter options. Well, now you can actually um, edit which filter options are available per dashboard. So I'm going to go to the edit. And in the edit, we now see a filter settings button. If I click on the filter settings button, we have two options. We can allow all filter dimensions, or we can just select a few. And when I do that, you see that the, the available filter dimensions are on the left. The selected ones are on the right. Let's say for this dashboard, just for, for example, org unit, double click it, turn it off, click confirm, save my changes, go back to my filter button and look, now all we see is period. So you can turn off those filters that, that are not useful to those dashboards that you have. The next thing that we need to look at is within each dashboard item, we have this three dot expanded option menu. So I'll click on that now, and you can see that I have all of my standard options for each dashboard item that we've had for, for a long time. We have a new one now here at the bottom as well, and that's view full screen. So if I click on view full screen, it makes the dashboard item take up the entire screen. Again, makes it much easier to everyone to huddle around a computer screen, um, to project a dashboard uh, directly through on a PowerPoint projection, or not PowerPoint, but through a projector, um, and, 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 you know, inter inter let me just get out of this. You get out of it by going to the top right corner. And the next thing that we are going to go uh, over quite quickly here is the mobile-friendly dashboard app. So we have been working very hard to bring all of the power of the DHIS2 dashboard onto your cell phone. And I think that we're getting very, very close to having all of the feature sets there. Um, what I'm going to show with you first now is what we released in the 236. So you can actually see that I'm logged into the play instance of 236. I'm on my cell phone. You're actually seeing my live cell phone right now. And we're looking at the same dashboard on the web browser as well as on my cell phone. And you can see as I scroll down, I'm currently in portrait mode and you see each one of the dashboard items is stacked on top of each other. If I go up, I can see that I can move in between my various dashboards at the top. If I click on case malaria, for example, I see my, my dashboard opening. If I go to view full screen on this first map, I can of course interact with it, zoom in, have all the same powerful functionality that I have on a dashboard just directly on my phone, go down into individual, you know, super low places, click on individual cases and, um, and perform all the kinds of analyses that I would standardly do on the web browser, but now on my cell phone. If I switch my phone over to landscape mode, there you go, you notice that the dashboard layout changes and now it actually looks the same as it looks on the web browser. So the same order um, and, and, and layout of the, of the dashboard, but I also have some additional features that are showing up. So I can edit my dashboard. I can uh, change basically anything about my dashboard here on my cell phone. I can add my filters. And again, I have my more options. I can show descriptions um, and even Looks like we might have lost Scott temporarily if you'd like to move on to the next presenter. Okay, do you want me to go ahead with the tracker part, Max, and uh, we'll take- Yeah, we, uh, can, we can catch up with Scott when he's back. Okay. Uh, yes, hey, I'm uh, Marcus Becken. I'm uh, gonna share my screen with you in a moment. There, I think you should see my presentation. Uh, on the tracker team, we are, um, uh, we don't have um, uh, as many features this time. We have three main undertakings that um, um, I'm going to focus on in this presentation. And um, the first one is um, performance improvements. During the last year, the 
a lot of our resources has been going into performance improvements to be able to support larger and larger scale of trackers. Um, the other main part uh, we are focusing on and, uh, and um, working on, on the tracker team is the new capture app. We are replacing the old uh, tracker capture uh, with a, a new um, modern uh, web app that um, we call the new capture app. Uh, so I will be showing you uh, some updates on the Capture app as well. Um, the last point I will focus on, main point I will focus on is the re-implemented services for Tracker. And this is, um, this is a bit going into the performance improvements. Um, these re-implemented services are our long-term strategy for uh, going to even bigger scale than, than um, uh, is possible uh, today. Um, so, um, with that, um, I will go into the first topic, which is improvements to performance. Um, we uh, had this as one of the key, as the key tracker focus from all stakeholders in the prioritization and um, alignment process uh, done, uh, uh, done uh, all, over a year ago. And improving performance is um, and have been um, our. Um, main focus um, for uh, for uh, at least uh, the last year. Um, one um, aspect that has given us extra fuel in this um, endeavor is the global scale up that has been driven by COVID and, and vaccination programs, especially COVID vaccination has been um, a driver for, uh, for these improvements. Um, we had a webinar um, releasing the COVID uh, vaccination package um, and uh, the main, uh, the main question that was uh, posed to us from the participants of the web webinar was whether we would be able to drive this uh, into scale and whether um, their, uh, the countries would be able to uh, track their entire population in, in vaccination programs. Um, so we uh, have been working on um, better and more form formalized framework for performance testing on large scale uh, vaccine setups. Uh, which uh, has been really useful the last year in in uh, ter uh, in terms of making better um, decisions and making better code and improving improving the performance. We have also been working directly with some of the bigger instances and removing um, bottlenecks and helping them to scale up. Um, these improvements have been made in three versions simultaneously in two thirty four. 35 and 36. So even though the work has been ongoing through 35 and 36, uh, the improvements have been um, have been merged on all these three versions and they were released in 234.4, 235.2 and 236.0. And we have been going out saying that um, if you're scaling a tracker, you should probably be on one of these three versions. Um, we know that the, the best among these three is 236 and uh, the second best is 235. Um, and 234 is, um, is the, um, the lowest performer among the three uh, optimized versions here. Um, I'm going to show you some numbers now comparing 234.3 and 234.4, which is um, not the biggest jump, but it's, uh, it's very descriptive of the uh, performance increase you would be see, seeing between 235.1 and 235.2. Um, and as well, um, in 236, you would have uh, the same improvements that I'm going to show you, uh, plus a little bit more. Um, so this first um, slide shows the median response time uh, running tests for 10 minutes with low concurrency. This is um, an instance running uh, uh, 3 million track entry instances, 3 million persons, and 6 million enrollments. Um, about 20,000 users and 20,000 org units. And uh, as you can see in, in the blue here, we see the low, uh, low performing 234.3, uh, and the red is the much better performing 234.4. Um, one thing to mark here is the Android sync, which is a very heavy operation, uh, syncing a lot of data, uh, at least in these tests, they are syncing a lot of tracked entry instances at once. And it could take up to 60 seconds before. And now with the optimized code, it will take uh, around five. 
the other cause is um, reducing um, uh, response times from, uh, from uh, seconds to milliseconds. Uh, here is um, a um, performance test performed with um, with uh, concurrency, and as we can see, with a hundred concurrent users um, doing operations, uh, two to three operations per minute, um, the um, uh, request per second for for the um, for the two thirty four point three, the old blue line here, is um, starting at uh, around three, and uh, with concurrency, it deteriorates. Um, and at 500 concurrent users, it's no longer uh, responding. Uh, we, with 234.4, with um, perf uh, improvements and removed bottlenecks, we see that uh, the um, request per second is uh, increasing uh, up until around 300 concurrent users um, uh, requesting uh, data from the server or sending requests to the server. And then it starts deteriorating, but it's still usable with uh, much higher, um, higher user counts. Um, I'm going to give you a quick side-by-side uh, -side demo here, and uh, I'm um, I'm doing this in um, in uh, two uh, versions of uh, 234. To the left, you will see the faster uh, 234.4, and to the right, you will see the old 234.3. And uh, keep in mind that uh, these improvements are also present in 235 and 236. Uh, the um, Database I'm running on is, uh, is the same as uh, 3 million people uh, tracked and 6 million enrollments. Um, there's the 20,000 org units in the database. And um, I'm uh, showing you now um, what it looks like on my, um, on my server in, um, uh, on, on the um, performance um, test servers. I, now switch sharing, so I hope you can see the side by side, uh, the two trackers side by side here. Um, and uh, to show one uh, comparison, I'm going to refresh uh, both of these uh, lists. And this uh, this is working lists that lists over uh, 600,000 tracked entity instances, which uh, in the improved version will take around four seconds. We can see to the left that it will be uh, around four seconds before we see the list. Uh, and reminding you, this is 600,000 um, tracked entity instances uh, being filtered and ordered, which is not a very efficient list. But uh, I still wanted to show you that uh, it's able. We are able to load so big lists. To the right, um, the the older uh, older 234.3 will still be working for a while, and it will take around one minute and 30 seconds. Um, I'm going to prepare a search instead and uh, search for uh, my demo user. Um, and I'm going to prepare the search in both uh, places. And I'm going to start it in, in uh, the upgraded uh, 34.4 to the left, and also at the same time to the right in the uh, not improved version. Um, and you can see that in the improved version, the uh, search in 3 million records is uh, taking around um, two, three seconds, and it will take six to seven in the not improved uh, version to the right. One last thing to show you from these performance test environments is, the, um, uh, is uh, visible here. If you change a value, as you know, in the tra tracker capture, you will see the, um, the uh, field turning yellow while the request is being done, and green when the request is uh, finished. Uh, so if I start in the slower, uh, an optimized environment. You can see the field stays yellow for a while and it turns green. It will take a second or two. Um, whereas in the uh, upgraded 234.4, you will see it turning green almost immediately. And this represents uh, the server uh, spending uh, much less uh, data on each uh, request. Uh, okay, so I will share my um, presentation again. Uh, some numbers from the ground, uh, they have been supporting and learning from some of the bigger uh, immunization campaigns. In Bangladesh, there was a, a campaign done over four weeks in 400,000 sites uh, with 34 million vaccinations. And, um, and um, uh, scaling this uh, application, we found some bottlenecks that were removed and we found optimizations that were helping this um, succeed. 
Uh, Sri Lanka has a vaccination program uh, with um, where they're entering around 60,000 entries per day. This is um, uh, a large number of users working to enter all this data. Uh, and they have 16 million people tracked in that database. Some numbers from Rwanda where they, are, they have a COVID um, case surveillance um, tracking 1.5 million people. Uh, as well as a vaccination uh, instance that is scaling and this is um, uh, still being scaled and they have a target of 3 million by the end of 2021 and 7 million by July 2022. All right, so next uh, topic is the uh, capture app and I want to show you some, um, some improvements that we have done there. Um, in the capture app, as you know, we are um, implementing functionality for tracking people in, uh, in uh, the same way as we had to do in the tracker capture app, which is the old, uh, old version of the app. So now in the, in the new capture app, um, I will show you some um, of the uh, improvements that has been released in 236. And um, let's see if I can share uh, the right screen. There, now I trust you can see my um, my um, uh, my capture app, which is the uh, which is the uh, next part of the demo. I'm going, going to show you how to register new tracked entry instances, how to search for tracked entry instances, and how to list and filter. Um, to take the last point first, um, in the capture app, it has been possible for a while to uh, to filter. Um, event programs. And uh, right now I'm looking at one event program and uh, the filter that has been there for a while. Uh, the new uh, functionality is that I can now select a tracker program and have the same sort of filter uh, with working lists and uh, also um, uh, other filters that I can apply to work when, with uh, the um, data in, in my org units. Um, for example, I can go to my Myandama that uh, is here and I can click uh, at uh, this uh, track entity instance down here and open the record. Um, as you will see when I click is that I will be taken to the old um, track and capture app and this uh, page here is the one we are working on and going to release in 237 in the capture app, but right now we are taken to the tracker capture app when you open the record like this. And uh, uh, we can fix the data that was uh, missing and go uh, back. If I click the back button now, um, I will be taken back to the same uh, list in the capture app. So the integration between these apps is, uh, is built to be as seamless as possible. And we, we hope you can now direct your users to use the uh, only the capture app for both tracker and event programs, even though you will be sent into the old, old app for some operations. Um, if I click new here, I could have added a new focus area in malaria focus investigation directly, or I can use the new dot dot dot, which is the uh, more of the wizard for adding something. Um, here I could, for example, have added a new person into the database without enrolling into a new program. What I'm going to do right now, however, is to change to malaria focus and add a fo focus investigation. Um, test in, like so. And when I save it, uh, you see that I will be taken to the um, old capture again. Uh, and this is uh, where I would have to enter event data uh, for 236. Again, for 237, this is, um, this is uh, going to change and uh, there will be a new UI also for this, uh, this part of the, um, the capture app. Um, I can then go back and potentially, if I'm working with cases as well, I might add the case. Um, I might uh, add a relationship to the uh, foci that uh, we just added. I copied the ID here. Uh, and I can link uh, my uh, case to the foci um, in the same uh, app. Oops, uh, if I also add this report date and save. Um, I will see my event data here and I can switch between event and foci. Um, the last um, button I wanted to show you was the search button here. And uh, in the same way, 
we can go directly to search for a uh, focus area since that was the program we had selected um, or we could have uh, gone to the search wizard which is um, allowing also search for uh, entities directly when i go to focus investigation and search um, i can um, uh, in the same way as uh, always we use these parameters and search and in the same way as we did in the old tracker capture, you will get a fallback. If you don't find anything in the program you're searching in, um, there will be an automatic fallback to prevent duplicates in the, um, uh, to, find, uh, to find searches from other programs. And here we see I, find, uh, I found my, uh, my search um, with the keyword test. Um, there, I will change my presentation again. Uh, we hope these uh, changes here will allow you in 236 to be able to use the capture app as the starting point for all these operations, um, or both event and tracker programs. Um, there has been some usability enhancements in the capture app, and um, one of them is this one, the year selector in the date picker. Um, for birth dates and some other kinds of dates, the year selector is um, important to uh, quickly go to the right uh, right year. Um, we also have some enhancements on the workflow uh, generally and the context selector. So uh, as you might have noticed, the program came before the organet and we have some new functionality in the buttons for new and search uh, to help the, um, the workflow in working with tracker and event data. Um, some uh, of the changes that is not so visible is that the metadata cache is now optimized and um, it, this means that it does not download more uh, data or more often than it needs to and it but it uh, downloads the data that it needs to and as long as you update the um, version number of your programs you will not have to tell your users to run the uh, the um, cache cleaner anymore we know that the cache cleaner has a bit of a therapeutic effect with users, uh, so you can choose whether or not to tell this uh, to your users, but uh, it should not be necessary anymore to use the, the cache cleaner. Uh, as long as you update your program version, that is. Some smaller enhancements to the tracker capture app. Um, the the no notes will now contain the full name, not the username. Uh, there was some settings uh, where the username was not really um, uh, telling uh, uh, the uh, users who entered the, um, the, the record. If the username is uh, a number, for example, it might not be so easy to see who actually entered the note from the username. Um, and then we also have enhanced the tracker to have a keyboard only data entry you will not have to use the mouse anymore to select the options and um, radio uh, buttons uh, some enhancements to the program rules um, the biggest one might be the, um, the first one here the expression validation and um, i'll give you a quick demo uh, there uh, the um, here you see the maintenance app and the program rule uh, screen. And if I go to the expression here, you can see now that we have this green check mark and uh, we have a um, uh, description of the um, of the expression at the bottom. Uh, and if you change anything, maybe if you change the name of a program rule variable, uh, you will be warned if this program rule variable is not uh, existing. You will be warned if the um, expression is not uh, well formed um, and you will be warned if uh, you try to use a function that does not exist. So um, we hope that this uh, feature will help uh, users making program rules uh, and avoid mistakes which can be costly and, uh, and hard to find uh, in the um, expressions. Um, there's also a new variable for completed date in expressions that can be useful if you're sending messages, for example, to um, uh, to your um, people that came into a visit and completed a visit. You might want to send them a message a few days after they uh, came to the clinic. And uh, it can be that the completed date can be what you uh, need to send this message in the right, um, at the right date. 
Um, there is an experts lounge for program rules on the at Wednesday. Um, that's uh, at four. So um, if you're interested in this topic, please uh, join us there. We will um, Pablo and uh, me will do um, a lounge and answer questions. The last uh, topic uh, that I'm going to go through today is the re-implemented services for Tracker. And um, the re-implemented services, uh, you say, what is that? Uh, we have um, actually for uh, um, for for the last several releases, we have been spending a lot of resources on a full re-implementation of the Tracker services. Um, and the implementation, the re-implementation is, um, is a little bit different from the performance and enhancements that I showed you in the first part of the session. The re-implementation aims to, um, we have rewritten and uh, re-implemented the services from the ground up um, on a much better architecture, which is um, gonna be um, more maintainable and have a greater potential for optimization. And we hope this is the way to take um, Tracker to even higher scales than is possible today. And um, uh, we can. Um, we also have implemented uh, more functionality in the new tracker services. The uh, services uh, now run program rules for validation, and um, and also calculation. And and there is a lot of new um, uh, options and possibilities with the uh, new tracker that we could not build into the old one. Um, the endpoint is released um, in two thirty six. And uh, the reason for releasing it now is that uh, we will allow integration for apps and scripts. So if you have your, have an app or a script, it might be a good idea to start looking at the new endpoint and, um, and uh, testing uh, your app with the new endpoints because the old endpoint is going to be re replaced in a future release. Um, I put 239 question mark. We are not totally sure when we are releasing it. It should not be before 239 at least. Um, and um, it is also great if you have any, um, any dependencies uh, that you reach out to us and let us know. Uh, the new tracker endpoints is pretty similar to the old ones in, uh, in terms of how they look on the outside and what you have to send in and how they behave. Um, and the main change in the new endpoints is how they are built. So we have built this new endpoint from the ground up to be uh, more uh, optimized for the future. Um, and this is my last slide, so I will hand it over to the next uh, speaker. I'm not sure if Scott uh, got his internet back or whether we are going to Android now. We're going yeah, to Android. Yeah. yeah, I think it's me. So, um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, evening or afternoon. Let me um, share my screen. Okay, present. Okay, I think you, you can see my screen, right? Um, okay, so uh, my name is Jose Garcia. I am part of the Android management team and I am representing Android in this, in this session. So yeah, I'm going to talk about what is new uh, in Android for the last, for the last year. But uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, the, the adoption, the DHS2 Android ad adoption. As we can see in this chart, uh, we, uh, we can see the, the number of active users from August 2019 till June 2021. And by, by an active user, we mean the uh, Android users that are using the application at least once in the previous 30 days. So as we can see here, there are like a big uh, increase between the February 2020 and April 2020 of uh, around the 300%. And this is because many implementations and many countries, uh, organizations, they change their priorities in order to track uh, new, the COVID cases. So this is basically due to COVID. And we, and we see that how these numbers they was maintaining over time. And, and then we can see like in November, from November of 2020, many implementations, many projects that were delayed, they, they started to be reactivated. Like I can think of, for example, some of in Nigeria or a big campaign, uh, immunization campaign in Bangladesh or other projects in Togo. So we have seen here experience a, a big increase as well uh, of Android usage. And then uh, in March of April, there is also a big peak over here 
that represents the main organizations for starting to use the Android application to track the COVID uh, vaccination delivery. And overall, we can see like uh, over the last two years, we are experiencing uh, an exponential growth of more than 700%. Uh, this represents uh, the countries that, is actual, that are actually using the Android application. Uh, we can see that Android application is being used in most of the African countries and also uh, in several of Asia, especially in the South, Southeast Asia. And we are starting some new projects in, America, in Latin America as well. Uh, Nigeria is the country with more active users, in the, this time representing more than 20,000 active users in the last 28 days. Okay, and this is one is what is happening right now in the last 30 minutes. So we can see there are like uh, almost 1500 active users uh, uh, that 75% are using a mobile device, 25% a tablet device. And we can see that they, they are more uh, now in the, located in East Africa and, and West Africa. Okay, now talking more about the, the features, what is new in Android uh, in the latest version. So uh, yeah, it's compatible with all the HS2 versions from 230. And now in this version, we are starting to use a new platform to track like the usage stats of Android. So it's called Matomo, it is open source, and you can track how the users is using your, your application. And this is, was a big requirement from the community. So now uh, any organization or any country, uh, they can have their own Matomo instance, and, they, and then they need to configure the, the, the DHC2 server in a way that, uh, that all Android devices will send, will send the information, the usage information to their Matomo instance. I'm going to show how in the next 15 minutes. And also in the, live, in the latest version, we are able to, users are able to log in in the app using the, they don't use, they don't need to use user uh, names or password anymore. They can use uh, Google accounts or Microsoft accounts. If they have configured the open ID in the server. Well, this, this is going to be ready uh, when the, the next patch release of the web is coming up in two, the 236.2 in the coming months. So also we have changed, we have revamped all the uh, navigation menus across the, the many screens of the, of the application that now they look much more modern now. So let me show you how it, it looks. So hopefully now that you can see my Android device, otherwise please uh, let me know. So if I am like selecting, for instance, the child program, I can see that it opens by default the, uh, the list view of the TIs. But then I can navigate to the map view over here, like other way of representing my TIs in my device. Okay, and uh, while loading, uh, we need to remember that uh, we are going to show uh, in the map all the TIs that has uh, associated any GPS coordinates, as it is here. Okay, so now let's go back to my list view, and I'm going to select this, uh, this TI. And when I open the TI, I can see the, the enrollment information and all the events as usual. But now I can navigate the different parts of the TI, for instance, the relationship using this, this navigation menu in the bottom. Here I have the relationships and here I have the, I have the notes. Okay? And this behavior, we can see this behavior also in the event dashboards and in, in data sets as well. Okay? Uh, so other feature that has been very, it was a, a big requirement from the community is the possibility of having offline analytics. Offline analytics is like the, the uh, for us, is how we can represent, analyze the data stored in the device using uh, charts or tables or, uh, and so forth. So this local data uh, is, yeah, is data that is stored in my device that maybe is not yet synchronized with the server. Okay, this is a big one. This is a big task. So the, 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 we need to uh, follow a, a, an approach of dividing this task in different phases. So for the, the first phase, that is what we're going to see now, uh, we are just centering in the TI analytics. So the scope is the enrollment. Okay, and we are going to see how we can render like bar charts, line charts, or even WHO growth charts in the scope or tables in the scope of the, of the enrollment. So let's see how this looks like in, in, in my Android application. So I am in the same TI as before, uh, Ryan Campbell here. So uh, now if I can click on this button, on this tab, so I can see that we have information about the feedback. This is not new. We had the feedback in the previous versions, but then uh, charts and indicators, uh, these are program indicators, these, these values over here. But now also we can see that there is kind of this line chart with a, a infant weight. This represents the values of that element that belongs to a repeatable problem stage. 
okay? And this, of course, this data element needs to be numeric. Okay? We also have the evolution of, of the height. That is also a data element that belongs to repeatable program states. And these are the values, how the values evolve over time. We can change the, the, the renderization here. Uh, I can say, okay, I would like to see this as a, as, a, as a bar chart, or I can see this one as a table, okay? Or I can see this one as a, as a value. So in this case, I am only showing the app, it's only showing the latest value that has been recorded. All right, so let's continue, let's move on. So maps, uh, we in Android, we have maps uh, since a year and a half ago, uh, but so far we were only able to display uh, attributes that belong, sorry, uh, coordinates, TI coordinates, enrollment coordinates, and event coordinates. And in this version, we are also able to display uh, attributes and data elements, which value type is coordinate. And so we are going to display, we are going to be able to, to know what is the current location of the user. Uh, that is quite important uh, when the user needs to navigate to any other specific location. So let's see again how this looks like in Android. So in this case, I'm going to open this program, the Malaria Case Diagnosis Treatment and Investigation. Uh, within this program, I am recording the, the, uh, the Malaria Cases and yeah, I'm going to open the, the, the map view. Okay. And then I am going to uh, select the, just the TIs, the cases that has been recorded this month. So here in my filter, I can select this month. Okay. And now I can see, uh, well, you can see the, the, blue, the blue dot, that is where I am located right now. Okay. So, and basically these are all the, the malaria cases that are registered in, in, in my area. In this example, uh, this opposition can mean like the household where this person lives. Okay. But now as we have we have the possibility of rendering here in a map like attributes as well. So imagine that in your configuration, you can have an attribute that represents the, lo the work location of the, of, the, of the person. So how can I do that? So in this case, I need to go to the, to the layer over here and then select the work location. This is an attribute, so I can select the work location. In this case, there is only one TI uh, of those five that has been added that ad so a value for that attribute. Okay, and this represents, if I select this one, so it seems that this TI is duplicated, but one is the attribute, the work location, where these people actually work, where this person actually works, and this represents where the person actually lives. Okay, we can also have, as you know, we can also render, let me go back to my previous um, setup. Uh, we can also render satellite view if we want. Okay, in this case, we have, uh, we have my view, uh, of, of the city where I'm living at right now. And then we can like, let me change this. Uh, we can render also relationships. Uh, so it's a, it's a let, this is not new, but I think it's worth it to mention as well in these two cases. So then I can see the different relationships that we have. So we can see that this in this, this is in this case of these two, two cases over here. This is valid, of course. Uh, this is a malaria use case, but this is valid as for, for COVID as well. But now what happens, imagine that I am a health worker and I need to visit this TI, this person over here that lives over here in order to conduct an investigation or to facilitate a test. So now uh, if I am selecting this person and I can select here in, my, in this card, in this carousel card over here. So I can click on the navigation button and this will show up all the maps app that I have installed in my device. In my case, I have Google Maps and Maps.me. So I'm going to use Map, Maps.me because it is an app that allows me to work offline, to navigate offline, okay? So I'm going to click on this one. Okay, this is going to take a little bit to render. But here we go. This blue spot, spot represent the where uh, the TI is, where the person is living, where, where is the household. So now I can click in the route too in this button. And then the application is going to tell me the, the best path to get to, uh, to that place. Okay. And it's the same with Google Maps. So I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the demo with Google Maps. I believe you all know how to use Google Maps. Um, okay, let's continue with more features that we have. Um, so also working list, uh, working lists uh, are uh, filters that are, has been defined in the in the server. Uh, so to, this is very useful for the for the Android users uh, because it allows them to have different views of their data. 
So imagine that we can have a list of events and a, and a list of events that can, they, it can be like tasks, tasks that need to be conducted like today or tomorrow or, the, or tasks that has been conducted in the previous month. Okay, so let's, let's see an example. So I'm going to open this, the Malaraki registration. Okay, and basically these are all the events that has recorded, that have been recorded. So, but now if when I'm clicking on the filter button, I can see here my working list, okay? This, my views, okay? So I can see the events as uh, has been assigned to anyone, the events that has been assigned to me, okay, let me, okay? And that I see that I have four, but then I can also see the events that has been assigned today, sorry, to me that needs to be conducted today. So these are like my tasks that need to be conducted today. And I can show them also, uh, as I said before, in a map. So we have now, I, I, I would like to say, we have now a nice way to render in a map what are the tasks that a person needs to conduct. And they can select the place that they want to go and click on the navigation button so they, they can have, then they, they, can, they can see what is the best path to go to the household or the patient as well. Um, okay, let's continue. Sorry. So uh, also uh, we have other things that we have, are features that we have are legends for data elements, uh, program indicators for events and indicators for data sets. Let's do a quick example, a quick demo with this. So uh, let's open this program. I'm going to select like any, any event over here. Okay, and we can see the legends. Uh, with 68 years old, we can see how the legends are being displayed there. And also now in the events, we have the same navigation button as we have seen for the TIs. And now we have here this uh, this button for the for the analysis. And we, what we can do is like to display the value of the program indicator. So in this case, we only one, have one program indicator and this, the one, this value is displayed here. And for data sets, uh, let me navigate to one data set, the child health, for instance. And now uh, we can see like the, this is for immunizations. We can see that we have a list of indicators here. We have two indicators and these values are being the total OPV doses given and total PCV doses given are being calculated on the fly. Okay, complete on the fly. Okay, so let's now change topics now. And uh, in Android, we have like a other products that is what we call the Android settings web app. We, you can like download, uh, this web app has been there for at least uh, eight months, I believe. And you can download this web app from the, from the DHH2 app hub, okay? What this, this app uh, does is gives you more possibilities regarding the configuration of your Android devices. So let's run a, a, a quick demo as well on this. So let me then, sorry. I'm going now to, be using the, the, so I guess now you're seeing the, uh, my DHS2, the DHS2 server. So I have installed that, that, uh, that uh, app in my, in my, in my DHS2 server. So I'm going to navigate through it. Okay, this is a, the general menu and uh, an overview. And what we can see is like in the general settings, we have now two new text fields, okay? And the, in these text fields is where you have to uh, introduce the URL of your Matomo instance. So if you want to track the, the, user, the usage of, of, of Android in your implementation and you have a Matomo instance, you need to place the URL here, okay? And whenever you connect to URL, uh, you need to start a project and then the project ID, it will like, uh, you, you need to fill the project ID here, okay? So if you have these two fields properly filled, then any actions that are happening with your Android devices is going to be tracked in your Matomo instance. Okay, we also have uh, SMS gateways. This is not new, but maybe just to uh, a quick reminder. SMS gateways, if you want to, uh, to, to, to allow um, uh, SMS synchronizations as well. And then uh, encrypt that device database. This is quite important because if you mark this, all the devices that are going to, that are uh, synchronizing with the server, the, the database are going to be encrypted. This is important when, when in your implementation, you need to manage like sensitive data as HIV, as, in HIV, as an HIV project. 
Okay, uh, this is not new. This has been there for uh, the last eight months, uh, but just a quick reminder that in the synchronization, we can synchronize how often the metadata and data will sync, uh, and also the pronouns, how many TIs uh, we want to uh, synchronize with, what is the maximum number of TIs to synchronize, the time periods, the maximum events to download, and in, within which time period, any time period, last month, last three months, last 12 months. So this is going to give you like a lot of granularity, a lot of power in order to configure uh, your Android setup in your implementations. The same for data sets. What is new in this version is this section about the appearance and analytics, okay? So uh, let's go through uh, through this section. So uh, before that, we have, as you know, we have like a different uh, filter options in our Android applications. Uh, we have the, um, in the home screen, and also if, if I open a, a program, we can see that there are like different filters over here. In this case, six filters. Um, so the community is telling us that this sometimes is very complicated because the end users, they normally don't need to have all these filters, but then we listen to other implementations that they really need to have these filters. So what can be like a long-term solution here? So basically what we have tried to do, to do is like this now in the appearance section, we are going to be able to define what are the filters that we would like to show uh, in the home screen for the programs or for data sets. So I'm going to run a quick example. Let's say that uh, I am only interested in the enrollment date as a filter. So I'm going to remove these, these filters over here. Okay, and also I can have, I can define this for a specific program. Let's say that this is my uh, general behavior, but for this particular program, the child program, I just want to have two filters, enrollment date and the event date. Okay, so let's save it. Save it. And then I'm going to synchronize in a moment to see how it looks like. We have the same for data sets. In the case of data sets, we only have three filters that we can like uh, 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 turn on or switch off. Okay, but in the analytics, the analytics here is where you can define the items that the, the Android users will see. Okay, so what happened if, for instance, you would like to see like the um, uh, a WHO chart, global chart. So this is not possible to, to visualize right now for the TIs in the web, but what we can do here is that uh, we, we can just select the program. You know that this is, again, this is uh, the scope is enrollment. So we need to set a program and then a repeatable program stage. In this case, we only have one repeatable program stage. And then I am going to uh, create this chart, chart nutrition by Jose. This is optional, this field over here. I am going to select the, the nutrition chart. Okay, I need to, sorry, I need to select the name again. The W2 nutrition chart, and then I can select, I'm going to select, we have three options here, wait for hate, I'm going to select this one. And now uh, every nutrition chart at WHO, they need to, you need to select the, the gender. So here you need to select which is the attribute that represents your gender, the gender in your configuration. So in this case it's gender, and then the option codes for females, and in this case female, the option code for males. And then what, I'm, what I would like to represent in my horizontal axis. So it's a data element or a program indicator. In my case it's a data element, and it's going to be the height. And the vertical axis is going to be a data element uh, as well. I'm going to represent here the, the weight. Okay, so I'm going to uh, add this and I'm going to save it. Okay, and now what I need to do is like, I need to like synchronize my, uh, my device. So let's do it. Okay. And while this is happening, just to mention that uh, what we are seeing is uh, pretty new. In fact, uh, this uh, menus over here, appearance analytics, has not been released yet, but they are going to be released for sure uh, during the next couple of days. Okay, so if you would like to play with this application, just stay tuned and then let us know how it works for you. Okay, and now let me see if this has been done with the not yet, but almost there. And also the, the, the users that needs, that can use this application, as I was to mention, they need to be super users. They need to have the all authority uh, linked to, uh, to them, okay? 
So, okay, this has finished the, 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 the synchronization. Now I'm going back to my home screen. And let's see how uh, the program, uh, so these are my, uh, the setup for, for the filters that they have. So if I open now the malaria case diagnosis treatment and investigation. Okay, now I can see that I only have one, one filter over here. However, if I open the, the, because we have, you remember that we have a specific settings for this particular program. So for the child program, we have the enrollment date and the event date. So let's see if this is what is happening. Okay, yes, we only have these two, the event date and date of enrollment, okay? And now what happened with my chart, the chart that I have defined in the under settings app. So if I open now this TI, Okay, I'm going to, to my analytic tab. And in fact, here we go. Now we can see this W2 nutrition chart. With this, I can like zoom a little bit to see the values. And the, the values are there. Okay, so just finishing my presentation. Uh, let me go back. Let me just some resources. So under updates, uh, everything is in the web. Uh, you can use this link over here. Uh, please let us know any question for that. There is an Android community of practice in this link. The Android SDK, is, is there any developers in the room? Uh, if you are interested in creating a new uh, Android application that is compatible with the HS2, we strongly recommend to use the Android SDK. And we're going to have a session of an, intro, uh, an introduction for the SDK on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Okay, so stay tuned. And that's all from my side. Thank you very much. And I think Scott, uh, you yep. are the next. back online. Lars, am I ready to go now? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. And let it be known that it was a uh, Zoom that crashed, not DHS2. DHS2 is doing fine. I kept on going, even without you guys. But now, but now we're all back together, and I'm sorry for the disturbance there. Um, I'm going to jump right back into where, where I think I left off with you, and that is talking about some of the new features in the Data Visualizer app. I've broken this into two parts. Uh, so the first part here is going through the ability now to have visualization type menu. We also have a universal data item search in the Data Visualizer app. We also now allow for combination charts as well as multi-axis charts. So let's just have a quick look at these. The data item selection menu, or excuse me, excuse me, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the chart or visualization selection menu. Now you see that we have 20 different uh, chart types available. That includes pivot tables as well. Um, and each one of these comes with a little bit of text with it to give you a little bit more information about what's how the best way to use this particular chart is and some recommendations. For example, if we look at the line, we see that we have track or compare changes over time, right? That's the appropriate use of a line chart. And we tell you a little bit about, we recommend that you put period as your category. So a little bit of clue you into what's the most optimal um, layout or configuration for this chart um, to help folks avoid mistakes or to use inappropriate chart types for different kinds of data. Okay, so we're going to still leave this at column chart. And then I am going to now go to my data. And sorry, let me just catch up on my, there we go. Um, and in my data, I am going to turn on, I'm going to search for A and C. And you'll notice that when I search for A and C, now with our new universal search in the data item selection, um, we are seeing any data item that has A and C in the name. So here we see a data element. Just below that, we see an indicator. If we scroll down a little bit, we start to see some event data items. And here we even see some program indicators. So now we're seeing all data items there in the list based upon your search results. Um, this it practically means that users, when they're using DHIS2 analytics, don't have to know the difference between a program indicator, uh, a, a, a data element, an event data item, or a standard indicator. They can just search by the name and it will show up based upon what they search. So I'm going to turn on um, ANC coverage one, two, and three, as well as ANC visits one, two, and three. Click update. 
And so I'm getting this bar chart now, and we're seeing that our ANC visits are the big talk um, bars and our coverages are basically can't see them because they're percentages. Well, we can do something to address this now. If we go to the series tab in the options menu, we can now move our coverage indicators over to a line. So now we can toggle between lines and bars for um, uh, in column and bar charts. So we'll move these coverages over to lines. And let's make it a little bit easier. Let's actually move these to the second axis. So now you actually see in data visualizer that we support up to four axes. And I'll move these over to the axis number two. Click update, and there you go. So now we see our ANC visits on the left in blue, our total counts, and we see our coverages at lines on top of those on axis uh, axis two. Um, and so it's you know practically speaking, in this situation, we're easily able to show total counts or total number of patients, total number of vaccinations any kind of regular data element. And then over that, we're, we're easily able to show um, vaccination rates, coverage rates, um, case load rates, any kind of indicator. All right. Let's move on to our second round of data visualizer. In this one, we're gonna talk about two category charts. We're gonna talk about uh, chart color sets, bar and column chart legends text styling in our charts, as well as show you the brand new scatter plots that includes outlier detection. So a bunch of cool stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and start with a blank chart here. I am going to now turn on, again, some A and C, but I'm just gonna turn on my A and C coverage. One, two, and three, click update. I'm going to change this to an area chart, update again. All right, so now we have a nice little area chart showing the last 12 months for our coverage. So we can see a bit of a trend analysis here. Let's now say, well, what if we wanted to filter by some of our additional dimensions? You see, we have some dimensions here with these little green dots. And of course, these green dots are telling us that DHIS2 has identified that this dimension is available to, be dis to disaggregate your data. So let's do that. Let's turn on facility types. So we have community health posts, clinics, hospitals. Let's turn all of these on and let's add them to our category dimension. I'm going to move it just so it's in front of period. Click update again. All right, and so now we have all of our various community, our, our various facility types showing A and C one, two, and three coverages over the last 12 months. So we can quickly do some trend analysis or some comparative analysis between our different facility types. We can see some crazy stuff is going over on in, in some hospitals with an ANC2 coverage of nearly 250%. That's probably the data quality issue. Um, and, and, but we can see you know, some nice you know, comparative analysis here with our two category charts. One really cool thing now that we also have, if we go to our style tab in our options menu, we have different color sets available. So most of you have grown up using our standard DHIS2 color set for the last 15 years we have introduced quite a few additional ones. So now we have a bright option, a dark option, a gray, one for colorblind and patterns as well. So let's just take a look at the colorblind just for an example. All right, so now you see the same chart, different colors for your data items that are suitable for those who are colorblind. Okay, I am gonna change this to a column chart. Still leave the same layout. Now under bar and column charts, we have a legends tab. So you notice this legends tab is showing up in our options menu. I'm gonna click on that, click display legend. And then I'm going to say use us that we have two options, use predefined legend per data item or select a single legend for the entire visual, visualization. I'm gonna choose this, the second option for the entire visualization. And I'm going to select my legend. Again, of course, these are predefined legends. I'm gonna click update. And now you see that all of my bars have changed colors based upon the legend that I, based upon the values that the bar is showing in accordance with the legend that's been applied. So if I hover over one of these, you see that this value 161.4 is showing up in the legend class uh, uh, greater than 100, which is this blue color. And I can quickly see some places where performance is quite poor. They're showing up in red. This area is 37.3, and that's following into the 30 to 40 uh, color class in this legend. 
OK. If I continue in the options menu, we are now able to style virtually all text on, um, on a chart. And just to give you an example of that, if I go to style, now I can choose a custom chart title. I'm going to give it the name title. I'm going to make it extra large. I'm going to show it up on the left. Let's change it to this outrageous pink, blue, or pink, purple color. Let's make it bold and italics. Click update. And now you see my title is huge in this ridiculous color um, and, and, uh, and easily able to be read. You can essentially do this for all text on the dashboard, or excuse me, in the Data Visualizer app. And of course, when you save it, it shows up on the dashboard as you see it here. The next thing to show in the Data Visualizer app is the new scatter plots. A really exciting new chart type here. You see it as it's, it's filled in our, our menu to give us a nice even 20 different visualization types. So I'll click on chart. I'm going to remove my A and C coverage. So my vertical axis, I'm going to add, let's just keep with the trend here, A and C one visits. On my horizontal, I'm gonna put in A and C two visits. And you notice that the layout of the layout menu has changed um, based upon the chart type that I've selected. So dynamically rendered there. Um, and so what happened? I did click update and we just see one point and that's just showing up for the country. So my org units is just at country level. Let's drill down to facilities, click update. And now we see all of the facilities in Sierra Leone. Uh, and we see that each, each point here represents a individual facility and the values for ANC1 and ANC2 are intersecting based upon the horizontal and vertical axis there. So this is, this is fun. You can do a lot of cool analysis with this. Um, one of the best ones to do is in the, again, in the options menu, if I can go to outliers, go to the outliers tab and I can apply outlier analysis. And in our outlier analysis, and we have three different outlier methods. Il y a également dans ce menu trois qualités qui sauf à nous, trois options qui sauf à nous, la capacité de modifier. Nous aurons une session le jeudi où nous allons plus parler de comment utiliser le système DHIS2, c'est-à-dire pour euh, incluser de façon plus pratique. Maintenant, à ce niveau, nous allons essayer juste de voir comment est-ce que nous pouvons utiliser les différentes modalités qui sauf à nous dans cette zone, c'est-à-dire comment est-ce que nous pouvons prendre, par exemple, le score standard, mais nous vous recommandons d'utiliser premièrement l'option qui s'offre à vous. Alors, lorsque je choisis la première option, vous allez voir qu'il y a une petite case qui s'offre à moi. Et maintenant, de cette case-là, je peux remplir. Threshold factor, that's kind of considered the normal threshold factor for detecting outliers for a particular methodology. For example, if I change Change it to modify z-score goes to three. If I change it back to interquartile range, it'll go back to 1.5. And then we also have another option to apply extreme lines. Essentially, extreme lines will put a line, a dotted line, over a certain percentage of the total national figures. That'll make sense here just in a second once I turn it on. All right, so here we have outlier analysis. So we see a, a, a bold, black line running through the middle. This is our median or our lead, a linear regression line. And then we have on either side of that our um, threshold lines, um, again, using interquartile range. And then everything that falls in between that is green. Everything that falls outside is showing up red. And we also have our extreme lines going horizontally and vertically. So again, this is essentially this vertical horizontal extreme line is showing the 1% value of total ANC one visits in the country. So anything that's beyond these extreme lines are considered extreme outliers, meaning that they're throwing off more than 1% of the total national figures. They're skewing national figures. Um, one cool thing that we also have with, uh, with, um, with scatter plots is you see everything here is kind of clustered together. And that's normal. You'd expect a lot of clustering um, for facilities of, of similar size. And if I want to zoom in on these, I can click and hold down and drag this blue box over that area, let go, and now it automatically zooms in. And I can keep zooming in until I can see each individual facility. To reset the zoom, it's just top right corner, zoom reset, and now I'm back. 
Okay, so that's not everything that was added to the Data Visualizer app, just some highlights. I've got to move on for the sake of time to the Maps app. So in the Maps app, a lot of new additions as well. We've added bubble, bubble maps because of um, a, a request from the countries that were implementing DHIS2 for COVID. We have event data tables um, for your event maps or event layers. Um, we also are um, dealing now with no data handling. We also have event status filters and very excited. We have population maps uh, provided through Google Earth Engine um, based upon world pop population estimates. So I'll just demo the bubble maps, um, event tables, and the population just for the sake of time. So I'm gonna go to the maps app. I'm going to add a thematic layer. I'm gonna choose data element. Let's go down to our immunization. Okay. And then I'm gonna choose BCG doses given. Uh, then I'm going to leave period, org unit, and filter untouched, go over, select to my style, go over to bubble map, click update, and here you go. So now you see a bubble map showing um, total BCG doses given per, per, um, per district here. So a nice, easy uh, way to demonstrate a lot of data quickly. Of course, the size and color of the bubble is proportional to the value measured against the, the uh, legend here. All right, let's remove this layer. Now let's add an event layer. I am gonna to go to my inpatient morbidity and mortality program. I'm going to leave period untouched, org units is gonna be fine. I'm gonna go over to style and let's style by a data element. None of this is actually new features. These were demoed last year. I'm going to now style by gender. And here comes my map of all events recorded in the inpatient morbidity and mortality program. Come back over here and let's show our data table. So you see our data table is now showing up below the map. And let's and each one of these columns is filterable. So let's say I just want to see those patients who had the uh, discharge of died. And maybe let's say those that are under five. So now I see um, all the all the died here listed under five. And you see that my map automatically updated based upon the filters that I was setting in the data table. So just a really quick way to filter out a lot of data that's shown on a map um, and, uh, and, and really kind of zoom in or, or specify uh, exactly what you're looking for or find what you, exactly what you're looking for. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is um, turn on some of these new population maps. Um, so we've been working very close with WorldPOP, um, who has very advanced population estimate, uh, estimating methodologies and produces a lot of maps that are widely used by, by you know, folks all around the world. Um, and through the Google Earth Engine, we're now able to pull these into DHIS2. So I am going to turn on the population age layer. Um, and essentially, they are able to provide population estimates for sex as well as age groups. Uh, so let's say, let's turn on all under fives. So we're going to turn on men zero to one, men one to four. And let's go down women zero to one, one to four. We're going to leave our aggregation method to sum and mean. That's fine for now. You can change this. There's additional options available. Um, organizational units and period will keep the same. Style will keep that the same. Organizational units right now is set to district. Let's add this. So right, right, what it's doing right now is it's pulling data from the Google Earth Engine. So it's going to take probably somewhere between five to 15 seconds to load, depending upon your country, how much data it's going to be pulling. So right now it's pulling all of Sierra Leone. Here it comes. And so what we actually see, let's just close the data table. What we see is a heat map of population. Um, we zoom in a little bit. We start to become a little bit more um, granular or the resolution improves a bit. Um, and if I click on this district, for example, you can see that my it's giving me some totals based upon the world pop estimates. Uh, we have a mean under five population of 4.08 per hectare and a total under five population in that district of 87,526. So that's pretty cool, usable, actionable information, hopefully. Um, now, what if you're doing some kind of um, facility-based outreach program, uh, vaccination campaigns? 
One cool thing that we can also do with this is if we go to our, at a, our facility layer, and let's say we wanna reach all children that are within a five kilometer um, uh, radius of the health facility, just for, for example. So I'm gonna come over to style, make sure my buffer's turned on, leave this to 5,000 meters or five kilometers, click update, and again, it's gonna, it's pulling a lot of the data from World Pop right now. So it's gonna take just a few seconds. Still loading, here it comes. All right, here are our facilities. And if we zoom in, we can see we have that five kilometer buffer. We click on it, then we can see for this facility has a mean population per hectare of 7.3 and a total under five population within its five kilometers of it of 3,303. Now, I think that is all I have time to show for maps. The only thing to point out is that we have a technical session on maps tomorrow, um, as well as an expert lounge on maps. So please do come with any maps questions. If you want more detail on these functionalities, I went through them very quickly. Uh, I do show up for those sessions and we're, we're happy to answer any and all questions that you have. So with that, I'll hand it over to um, Austin and Lars, who will take us through the last presentation on platforms. All right. All right, thanks very much, uh, Scott. Uh, a lot of exciting <clears throat> features there. So we are running a bit late, um, but we'll try to cover now the uh, platform uh, products in, in the last section here. So it will be myself and, and, and Austin presenting here. So in, in 236, um, we came out with a few new apps. Um, the SMS app was completely rewritten uh, based on the new sort of React um, tech stack that we have. Um, and the new app is, is quite, quite a lot nicer. We removed some of the quirks and sort of not working functionality that we had in the old one um, and replaced it with a, a much better looking, much more user-friendly app. So just to give you a super quick glimpse into how that works, if you go to the HS2, um, <clears throat> you can search for SMS. Um, the previous app was called mobile. This one is called SMS and it's mainly dealing with or only dealing with SMS uh, related functionality. So, so here we can see we can add the gateway configurations um, for, for SMS gateways. Um, <clears throat> you can define different commands. Uh, for instance, we can define key value parsers um, and so on. Um, and here we have detailed information, right? Reply message, wrong message uh, format, no user message. And then we can add um, you know, the keywords for the different data elements to submit it uh, over SMS and so on. So, so pretty much the same <clears throat> sort of functionality, but uh, much better looking, much more user friendly um, UI here. Uh, we have the, the sent and the received um, SMS over here. OK. Um, we also included a new version of the import-export application. Um, and again, um, it's the same functionality, except that we made, made it a lot more user-friendly, looks better. Um, and we also exposed a lot of the options that we have in the API in the user interface. So in this case, <clears throat> the API actually had kind of outpaced the UI quite a bit. Um, there was a lot of you know, options that we haven't exposed in, in the app that, that, are not, that, that is now exposed in the, in the user interface. So by having a look here, we can see that we support, we have an import section, we have an export section, um, there's, there's data imports, there's um, event imports, GML, metadata, fragment instance, and so on and so on. And you can see here that we have a lot more of the options that we support, like the strategy for, for how to import different types of, of data, um, how to import you know, different types of metadata, how to handle um, errors, import strategy, uh, merge modes, and so on and so on. There's also advanced options down here. So <clears throat> a lot of new options for you are available now in the, in the in import export application. Okay. Um, then um, in the later versions, we also spent a lot of efforts on improving uh, you know, sort of data quality support in DHS2. Um, and that goes for data sort of validation rules. It goes for outlier detections. Um, Scott just showed you how you can use scatter plots with you know uh, lines to identify um, outlier outliers. 
Um, in 236, um, we also had the ability to do set score based um, outlier detection. So set score basically means the number of standard deviations a value is from the mean, right? So, and, and this is a very sort of typical and popular uh, method in statistics for finding outliers in data sets. So the good thing with the new functionality that outliers is basically ordered by the absolute deviation from the mean. So basically how far the, the value is above or below the mean. Um, and they also <clears throat> basically rank the values by the deviation from the mean. And the good thing here is that we can actually then identify the values easily, which impact the aggregate analytics the most. Previously, the problem was that we only had, you know, all um, outliers returned without any significance or, or order. Um, and that made it very hard to kind of fix the problems that actually impact the, the sort of aggregate analytics, which is what we basically want to do at the end of the day. So if we go to the data quality app, <clears throat> we can now see that there's a, there's a section called outlier detection. So we can go here, we can change, we can select the data set, um, we can select the organizational unit or just keep it at the national level. It's also quite a lot faster now. So you can basically do larger data sets in one go. Um, we can select the start date. So um, we can just leave it there. By default, it's three months before the current date. Um, in terms of the algorithm, we can either decide to use the set score based method or we can use min max values. Min max values uh, have been there for a long time. This is basically a way to inject custom values into the database. Um, we can support, we can select a threshold, um, we can say the max um, results, and we can also, as an advanced option, we can also set the start and end date for the data period. So this is essentially the start end date for the output report period, and this can be the start end date for the underlying data to be analyzed. Uh, and then, importantly, we can also then sort the results by absolute deviation from the mean or, or set score. <clears throat> so by running this, it takes about three seconds on the demo database. Um, we basically get back a, a list, which is now ordered according to the deviation from the mean. So, so as an example, we can see here that uh, weight for age or on the about middle line. Um, here we have a value of 1500. Um, we can see that the mean is 147. So this is quite obviously an outlier. Um, and the deviation from the mean is then essentially 1,300 or something. So, so this is a way to quickly find the outliers that actually impact your data and then fix them. Uh, and that way sort of clean up and, and make your aggregate uh, analytics more reliable. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing we added in, in uh, 235 um, was support for something called OpenID Connect. So some of you know what this is. Uh, to those who don't, um, OpenID Connect is basically a standard that's based on OAuth 2, which is an open um, authorization protocol. Um, it's basically a standard for internet users to basically grant third-party applications access to their information um, without giving out your password. So it's typically those cases where you say something like, you know, login with Google or login with Facebook that you probably all have seen. So OpenID Connect is an authentication or identity layer built on top of OAuth 2. And it basically provides a more modern sort of uh, programming experience with a RESTful JSON API uh, and the use of something called JSON Web Tokens. So the benefit of this um, functionality would basically be to allow for single sign-on across multiple systems. So if you have an identity provider using, let's say, Google or Azure um, AD Connect, sorry, Azure Active, Active Directory or Facebook or whatever, um, you can now have a single sign-on across all your systems in, in your organization. So that means that there's no need to go and sign in everywhere. You can sign in one place and then automatically be signed in into DHS2. Um, and there's also no need to, ma to maintain yet another dedicated password for these two users. You can just reuse what you already have. Um, to do this, you need to map your existing users using the open ID field on the user. Um, so that one has to match the sort of identity of the uh, record you have in your, in your uh, registry. Um, we do support many sort of providers out of the box. Some of them we have made special providers. Um, those include Google, um, Microsoft Azure AD, and something called VSO2. Uh, we also have a generic provider, so it works with pretty much uh, most popular providers out there. Yeah. And this is very carefully documented in the installation guide, so have a look there if you would like to enable this. Okay. 
Um, we also did a couple of improvements around users. So you can now set user account expiration. So in the user screen now, if you go to user app, um, the add or edit user, uh, we can now set an expiration date for the user. So that's very good for the cases where you'd like to imply, employ some sort of security policy um, that says, for instance, you know, users that haven't logged in um, or people you, you would like to basically create user accounts which expire at a specific date. Uh, and this is great for, uh, for instance, uh, guest users. If you have a guest user in your, in your organization, um, you can give the person basically a temporary account that, that expires at a given date. We also have a new um, job in the scheduler application for automatically disabling users which haven't logged in for a certain number of months. Um, so this is good to comply with, uh, you know, security policies. Sometimes you would like to say that people haven't logged, that haven't logged in for, you know, three or six or nine or four months, they should automatically uh, be disabled in the system and require um, kind of explicit uh, enabling to, to get back in. Um, and this is good to avoid kind of dead user accounts and having user accounts that kind of retain the system for a very long time. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm just going to mention a couple of sysadmin or, ad, or administrator uh, improvements in the system as well. Um, we have a new option now in the PHS conf configuration file for disabling the change log or the audit log. Um, this can be quite helpful when you have a centralized system that acts as a central um, data warehouse essentially for multiple upstream systems. So, so when you have lots of sort of, let's say country or the province systems reporting into a central instance, you don't really want all these change log to be building up because they just, you know, add a lot of, um, spend a lot of disk size on your server for, for no reason really, because the audit will still be there in the, in the upstream systems. So now there's an easy way to, to basically disable those. Um, we have another option for disabling server-side program rules, which can be quite helpful uh, to debug you know, stability issues, performance issues, and so on. Um, when it comes to the user APIs, um, we also realized that the user's endpoint was a little bit too open um, for many, many people's liking. Um, and especially if we got a few security audits that they wanted us to make it more restricted. So we now essentially have two endpoints for users. One is the user lookup one, which is open, which requires no authentication, uh, but only provides very limited info like the name, uh, username, and so on. This is for applications that need access to this, like the messaging app, for instance. And for the main users endpoint, we now require a specific authority uh, called view users to be able to see this one. So this allows you to basically lock down sensitive data around users in your applications. Um, we added data sharing for SQL views, meaning you can now distinguish between people who should be able to read or, or change the SQL view and people that should be able to view the underlying data for the SQL view. Um, and finally, we improved the performance of the integrity checks quite a lot. Uh, previously, it was, it was getting quite slow as we have seen very large instances with a lot of metadata. It got um, slow to the point of almost being unusable. We have redone the entire underlying uh, solution now. So it's using database SQL queries to a much bigger extent, uh, which makes the thing a lot, lot faster. So that's good. Um, when it comes to translations, we now have uh, a lot of new entities and properties being translatable. Um, this particularly came through as part of the metadata packages work. Um, so now things like visualization axis, labels, target lines, subtitle, title, and so on can be translated. Um, tracked into instance event filters can be translated. And also fields within validation rule like the instructions, um, program description or report on the event date, program rule warnings and error messages, and also app names can now be translated as well to provide a complete sort of internationalized experience to end users. All right, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Austin to talk a little bit about the platform improvements that we have. And just to let you guys know, we have about two minutes left, so hopefully it's yes. quick. Thanks, Lars. I will try to make this very quick. Um, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Austin McGee. I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the uh, application platform improvements that we've seen in 235 and 236. The main one of those is called continuous application delivery. Um, this was introduced in 235 and improved in 236. Um, and it's been kind of a silent feature because we haven't uh, seen much use of it yet, uh, but you'll be seeing more of this. So we wanted to really make sure that it was uh, well, well introduced. 
Um, basically, what continuous application delivery means is that bundled applications in the DHIS2 core can now be overridden by installed applications. Uh, and this allows the core team to build and deploy applications on a, a more regular cadence and deploy those through the App Hub to DHS2 instances that can upgrade those applications without necessarily needing to upgrade their server, which is a much more complex and time consuming process. Um, apps are now starting to also support multiple DHIS2 server versions. So we'll be able to uh, introduce features to those applications that can be used on 235 and 236, for instance, not only 236. Um, in practice, this means that implementations get new app features and fixes faster. Um, and we'll see more and more of the core applications coming onto the App Hub soon. Just a very, very quick demo of that. Uh, you can see here that I have installed in a 235 server, a new version of the dashboard application, which I can open up and at the same URL where you would normally find your dashboard application, I now have this version that has a different title and has implemented some features that were not in the version that's bundled in 235. So all the links and everything to this application continue to work. Uh, I can also do um, additional um, overrides of other applications. For instance, I can override the app management app, which is the one we're looking at here. This will take a moment um, and I will show you that uh, renewed interface, which will be a completely new interface of that application in just a moment. While that is loading, I'm going to talk a little bit about the DHS2 App Hub, which has been completely redesigned. Uh, this is a much nicer interface for searching, viewing applications that developers across the world have uploaded um, and have been uh, vetted by a review board at the UI, UIO core team. Uh, we are reviewing application submissions on a weekly basis. We've published a set of guidelines uh, that you can find at developers.dhs2.org. Uh, and those, those guidelines uh, implement some certain requirements for apps that are uploaded to this App Hub so that you can be, uh, have a little bit more confidence in, in what the, the quality of those applications are. So those apps should all be useful and appropriate for DHIS2. They should be generic and be open source. So you can always see what source code is used to build those applications. They should be well designed and documented and they should be secure and performant. Um, so we have a session on this tomorrow at two o'clock uh, Central European time um, if you want to learn more. I'm going to go now uh, very quickly to show this application that I just installed. So I just overrode the, the app management app. So I'm going to refresh this uh, and you'll see that there's a completely new interface for the app management app that is going to be loaded here in this 235 instance. Uh, this is a, a, a version of the app management app that has a very nice interface for searching apps on the App Hub, for seeing the apps that are available with updates from the App Hub, uh, including the core applications that uh, are bundled with DHIS2. Uh, and again, this is a 235 server with an updated version of the app management app that it was not bundled with, uh, and it can be used to update other versions as well. So you'll see more of this coming soon. The final slide that I have here is about uh, improvements to the application platform, which if you're not sure what that is, it's a, a common framework that we're using for all core applications in DHIS2. We're at about 70% uh, of the core applications that are now have now adopted this platform in 236 uh, and should reach 100% uh, shortly. Um, a number of new components uh, have been added to the UI library in the last year. Um, here's a, a few of them shown on the screen here. We've also introduced the ability to detect the server version that you're talking to automatically so that you can have an application that, that is able to work with multiple versions of DHIS2 core. Uh, we have a standardized uh, app alert service, and we've also been developing our uh, developer community uh, with the introduction of uh, a developer advocate in Deborah, uh, one, of our, one of our new team members who joined us in January. Uh, and has been doing a great job um, leading trainings, academies, and meetups for developers. You can learn more about all of that at developers.dhs2.org, as well as uh, a session that will be running at 3 o'clock PM on Wednesday, uh, Central European time. I think that's it for me. Um, I will open it up for questions, but I think we might be out of time. Um, so I think that's it for the session. 
Yeah, I'd just like to say that if you uh, have additional questions for the software team, you're welcome to add those in the community practice thread. We do have uh, quite a number that are been asked in chat and are posting those answers there as well for the record so that people can see the discussion and continue it uh, from now on. And with that, I think we need to move on to the next presentation since we're a few minutes over time. So I'm gonna pass it over to Elaine.